Welcome to this IFA GAROP webinar, the second in a series of two in preparation for the 11th session of the United Nations Open-Ended Working Group on Aging. My name is Andra Stenko, Project Officer with the International Federation on Aging, or IFA, and we'll briefly review housekeeping. This webinar features expert remarks, um, which will be uh, from speakers who will be introduced shortly. In the chat box, you will find speaker biographies, key resources, and please feel welcome to share relevant resources and comments there as well. Please post any questions for the speakers using the question and answer function rather than the chat box, and they will be addressed in moderated discussions throughout the program. The webinar is recorded and will be posted on the GAROP website and the IFA YouTube channel. It is now my honor to pass the floor to the moderator of today's webinar, the chair of the Global Alliance for the Rights of Older People, Dr. Kieran Ribeiro. Thank you very much, um, Andra. And uh, thank you to all of you who are taking um, the time today to join us. Uh, we do hope that uh, it will be uh, uh, a useful and valuable um, way to spend the next hour and 15 minutes with us. So thank you for joining us. Um, uh, as Andra has said, that this is the um, second in a, in a series of two webinars. And really the, the point of this webinar is to get you ready for the 11th session of the UN uh, Open-Ended Working Group on Aging. It's been organized by the Global Alliance for the Rights of Older People uh, in partnership with the International Federation of Aging um, I, I will be moderating the session today, and I'm the chair of, of GAROP. It has been two years since the last um, UN Open-Ended Working Group uh, on Aging met in person in New York. Um, and the last session, the 11th session, uh, was scheduled for April 2020, but due to the um, COVID-19 pandemic, was postponed to this, uh, to this uh, end of this March. Um, this is a crucial opportunity for all of us, uh, anyone who's alive today, and particularly if you are an older person or if you know or are in contact with someone who you love who's an older person, to discuss their rights and the need for a new convention on their rights. Um, it, is a, it is therefore vital that we have a very strong presence of, of both older people and civil society in this postponed 11th session next month that will mostly be taking place on a virtual platform. So that gives us added opportunities, but also some challenges. And I'm hoping that we can spend a bit of time talking about those. Although we're still waiting for the official details to be confirmed um, with respect to um, uh, whether there'll be, a, how many different ways we can provide input into this meeting that NGOs can be involved, including oral statements and written inputs. Today's webinar will focus on the key messages and the latest evidence and analysis around older people's rights and to support you in doing this work because without your voice and your input, this, this open-ended working group would, would, not be, um, would not have the same impact. We will also hear from some of the members about how we can provide this work and, and put it into real action and join forces to do that. So um, <clears throat> we are privileged today to have with us a very impressive lineup of people who really know um, the, the human rights uh, arena and, um, and I will like, I'll introduce them one by one. Uh, please use the question and answer function on your, um, on your um, devices to ask your questions at any time 
this is the function that we'll be monitoring as a moderator. I'll be keeping an eye on that. Please also note that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the IFA's YouTube channel and the Garrett website. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Rio Hada. Um, so uh, many of you may already know Rio, but um, Rio is currently coordinating the work of the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, or OHCHR, in the area of economic and social rights. He also leads the work of OHCHR on human rights of older people and serves as the Joint Secretariat with DESA for the Open-Ended Working Group on Aging, which is established by the General Assembly with the mandate to strengthen the protection of human rights of older people. Since joining OHCHR in the year 2000, he has worked on a, a, on a number of mandates related to their rights and um, to development and economic as well as social rights on housing, food, education, poverty, and foreign debt. Over the past several years, Rio has led OHCHR's human rights mainstreaming agenda in the UN system and coordinated UN interagency efforts to integrate human rights into the policies and programs of the UN development system to promote their rights-based implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Prior to OHCHR, Rio served at the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs in New York, um, the UN Office at Vienna, and the UNDP, as well as the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific on a wide range of issues, including poverty, social development, post-conflict reconstruction, reconciliation, international trade, South-South cooperation. He has a master's degree in international affairs from Columbia University. But apart from all of those formal um, training and, and experiences, Rio really knows this area very well. So any question you have that most of us can't answer, I think Rio might have an idea of how to answer them. So without further ado, Rio, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kiran, for that introduction. I must say, I'm, I'm every day I'm learning uh, all along together with you guys uh, on other persons. And I have had um, pleasure to participate in the similar briefing sessions uh, that you organize, the GARP organizes uh, every year before uh, the working group. Um, yes, I think this is going to be a key session. Um, it's been uh, 10 years since the, the first um, working group was held. And we are now in this COVID situation. And as Kieran said, we haven't met in two years. And the format is, is going to be changed. There's going to be a new, new arrangements. We still don't know exactly uh, what, but because we are in this turbulent time, and all these uh, destructions, I think we need to stay focused on the substance of our key messages uh, to shape and influence the future directions of the working group. So I very much welcome this discussion today, and I hope that uh, uh, we can discuss maybe some of those elements and, and you can further reflect upon them before the working group session. But having said that COVID is, is a big challenge, we also need to capitalize this momentum that we have now um, with the Secretary General recommending in his policy brief to accelerate the work of the working group. And also the similar recommendations emerged out of the global consultations with people directly in the occasion of the UN 75th uh, anniversary last year. So I said that we need to stay focused on the substance and, and the key focus of that substance is obviously on the gaps in the protection of uh, human rights of older persons and their enjoyment. And the COVID-19 highlighted even more sharply the inadequacy of the current international or national framework. Uh, 
So I'd like to talk a, a little bit about what we have been doing uh, in terms of looking at these gaps. Um, many of you know that um, in 2012, soon after the, uh, the working group um, started its mandate, um, the office took the initiative of preparing a paper outlining what are the norms that's currently there um, in terms of protection of older persons and what are the gaps. So this 2012 study um, has since been considered very useful by uh, many stakeholders. And uh, at the last session two years ago, um, many uh, NGOs and several member states have requested that we update uh, that 2012 study. And we have been doing that uh, over the last year, and, and which uh, turned out to be quite timely uh, because of the COVID uh, the situation and the tragic impact on older persons. So the study update is it really builds on the work of the many people, uh, independent expert reports, the working group discussions that have happened over the last uh, uh, several years, the work of the human rights mechanisms, and most, most of all, the, your work in civil society and your, your inputs to bring the voices of older persons in the work of the uh, open-ended working group. So as an update to the uh, 2012 study, the focus is, I mean, one focus is really to try and capture the main developments since 2012, uh, including in terms of regional development. And it undertakes a critical analysis of what has been happening or at least efforts to strengthen the human rights protection of older persons. Um, it identifies how the UN human rights mechanisms have engaged with the human rights of all older persons, especially through the treaty bodies. This is a, a major sort of update part because the previous study did not really look into what the, uh, the treaty bodies uh, have said beyond the uh, general comments. And it then uh, goes on to evaluate the extent as well as the quality of that engagement by UN human rights mechanisms. Um, it's not just numbers of hits or numbers of mentions and the recommendations. Uh, yes, those numbers are important, but not just numbers, but what do those specific references, recommendations, looking at their patterns, their intensities and, and their follow through and, and implementation. Uh, these are the things that uh, uh, which can indicate or at least give us some idea about the real substantive, substantive engagement of the UN human rights mechanism. And, and, and by way of saying that, the member states themselves with the uh, protection of older people's uh, rights. And, and so we recognize that there have been some progress and in, indeed some significant progress in some areas. But the critical question is really, how does that progress measure up with the extent of gaps that we are seeing and amplified in this pandemic, both in terms of norms and standards, as well as the protection of older persons in real life. And so we need to look at that progress against, in, so we need to look at that progress in the context against the scale of the violations and gaps. And in terms of gaps, I think we are in agreement here about the widespread nature and impact of ageism and age discrimination in all spheres of life, undermining the autonomy and independence of older persons and undermining the ability and potential of older persons to contribute to society. And there is a scale of elder abuse, violence, and neglect, which we still don't know fully about. We, there's still a, a lack of data and evidence to really measure up the, the scale of elder abuse. A couple of years ago, WHO came up with the statistics, one in six uh, older persons. Um, but we know that potentially the number is 
much greater because this is one of the under most underreported uh, violation of human rights. And there is a lack of social protection, inadequate uh, long-term care support, access to justice and, and remedies. And there are other emerging issues that um, we haven't really fully addressed, such as the impact of new technologies, um, role of business in, in, in protecting the human rights of other persons, um, human, humanitarian situations and the protection um, in that context, including in the current COVID-19 pandemic. And what follows from this analysis is that the international human rights framework, as well as global policy frameworks such as MIPA, have not really delivered on its promises to stimulate much more focused action to better protect the rights of older persons, as well as to raise the accountability of those actions or inactions. Having said that, the international human rights treaties have done that uh, in many other areas, engaging national governments, national societies, and, and they did stimulate focused actions at the national level. But it really has not yet made that quantum leap in relation to the rights of older persons. And of course, this may not sound new to us, but what we have tried to do with the updated study is to analyze that evidence, looking at the number and quality of recommendations coming out of the UN human rights system and compare with the experience of other conventions like uh, CRPD. And we looked at different arguments and options. And for example, there are those um, who say, yes, we need to do more. So let's improve existing systems and they can do the job. So we looked empirically at such arguments and the study asked the question as to, to, to what extent is the international human rights system adequate? And if not, what do we do about it? And we certainly found that there is a need and a significant scope to improve the existing system's performance. But the problem is that more efforts along the same old approach might not result in significant changes because of the existing conceptual or practical limitations. So actually we need a significantly different approach. And the ultimate argument here is that a new convention would be uh, the most, or if not one of the most effective way to bring out that quantum leap. And this was seen clearly in the case of CRPD, as well as other conventions addressing specific groups. So in wrapping up my presentation here, I would like to recall the mandates of the working group, particularly the, the second resolution, um, 69 slash 139, which requested the working group to submit at the earliest possible date a proposal containing inter alia the main elements that should be included in an international legal instrument to promote and protect the rights and dignity of older persons which are not currently addressed sufficiently by existing mechanisms and therefore require further international protection so responding to this very clear mandate would require us to directly address the question of whether a new new normative instrument would make a unique and significant contribution to the efforts to ensure the full enjoyment of all the human rights by older persons. The record of engagement by the human rights mechanism so far has been a mixed one. Uh, and certainly overall, um, we cannot say that there is a coherent approach to the human rights of older persons in the current framework. And the absence of a specialized instrument is certainly part of the reason for it. And experience with other specialized treaties at the UN and regional levels uh, point out that such treaties add significantly and uniquely to the realization of the rights by, that they guarantee. And 
and we hope that this will equally be the case with the new normative instruments on the rights of older persons. And lastly, here's a fundamental gap. Uh, there is no clear articulation in any of the UN human rights treaties of the nature and significance of aging, its social constructs, and the phenomenon of ageism. So we need a coherent, comprehensive conceptual framework and international standards to protect the rights of older persons that address the reality of older persons' lives. Otherwise, the international system will continue to fall short in delivering its promise to ensure that all persons, including all older persons, fully enjoy their human rights and fundamental freedoms. I stop here and I, I look forward to engaging in the discussions a little bit later on. Thank you, Kiran. Rio, thank you very much. I, um, I'm very uh, happy and very um, impressed with how clearly and succinctly you have articulated um, the, the, the need for a new instrument and why the previous um, efforts that we have starting from 1948 to the present do not do justice or serve the purpose that we need, that needed to serve. Let's move on. Um, I think we'll have Bridget speak and then we'll open it up for questions for the two of you. Um, so next, our next speaker is Bridget, Bridget Sleep, um, who again um, may be familiar to m many of you, but I'll just give you a quick introduction. Uh, the, so Bridget is the Senior Rights Policy Advisor for HelpAge International. Bridget is the senior, um, uh, sorry, she is um, a global network. She works with a global network of, organ of organizations promoting the rights of older people to lead dignified, healthy, and secure lives. After working at um, Universidad Eduardo Mondlein in Mozambique, uh, Bridget completed a master's degree in international human rights at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies at the University of London. Since then, she has worked on human rights and development at the Panos Institute, International Family Health, and now Help Age International Benefits from her presence, where she has helped focus on the strengthening and the rights of older people. Um, one thing I can tell you about Bridget, having known her for uh, a short time, that Bridget is one of the most clear and most articulate people on this topic. And without taking up any more of her time, Bridget, thank you for joining us today and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kieran. And um, you, you, you've set me a challenge now to be clear and articulate this afternoon, so I will do my best. Um, if we could have the first slide, please, Andra, that would be great. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so, as, as we have been talking about for a while now, during this pandemic, older people have been subjected to greater restrictions of their rights than others through age-based isolation measures, the use of age to deny access to medical resources, and the suspension of services that disproportionately affect them. What I'd like to do today is share with you what we have learned from a consultation that our partner organizations carried out in October last year on the impact of these public health measures on older people's rights, the finding of which are in our new report, Unequal Treatment, um, which you can see on the slide there, uh, 101 older people, it was 63 women and 38 men between the ages of 50 and 96 years old were consulted across 10 countries. Next slide, please. And these 10 countries were, and you can, you can test your recognition of the flags now, they were Argentina, Canada, the Dominican Republic, Jordan, Kenya, Kyrgyzstan, Pakistan, the Philippines, Rwanda, and Spain. Next slide, please. And I'd just like to acknowledge all the partners listed here for their great work on this consultation. I think some of you are on this call today, and I'd just like to thank you. We certainly couldn't have done this without you. While the consultation only reflects the views of those older people who were interviewed, it did show that older people's rights have been negatively impacted by both age-based public health measures that discriminate against them and by general population public health measures. As an older woman in Jordan said, 
the measures the government has taken with regard to older people have done more harm than good. It doesn't make sense for me as an older person to be quarantined alone in my house without being allowed to see my children and grandchildren. The psychological harm has been much greater than that caused by coronavirus. Next slide, please. Although a small number of the participants in the consultation said that restrictions on their movement had enabled them to spend more time at home or on leisure activities, and some had been able to continue to access services, the majority said that the more severe restrictions they'd been subjected to compared with younger people had had a harmful impact on their well-being and their enjoyment of rights. As well as their right to non-discrimination, this included their right to autonomy when they were not given the opportunity to exercise their own judgment about risk or make their own decisions, their right to a family and private life when they weren't allowed to mix with younger generations, see family members, both in the community and in care homes, or see their loved ones before they died or attend their funerals. The right to work when they weren't allowed to go out and work. Their right to health when they couldn't access health services they needed or had to wait a very long time for appointments or couldn't get or afford the medication that they needed and their right to care and support when they had no choice about the care and support services they would receive. Next slide, please. Some of the people that we interviewed said that service providers discriminated against older people because of their age or because service providers were afraid of getting COVID-19 from them. An older man in Rwanda said, they only cater for the youth. There are few workers and they don't interact with many people because they're afraid of coronavirus. They're, they only like working with younger people. They're neglecting older people. But I think what struck me most about the responses, and we've been doing similar consultations with older people on their rights for the last five years, was the different experiences of the people interviewed. Next slide, please. Knowing the right people or having access to certain resources has allowed some older people to enjoy their rights more than others. A number spoke about unequal access to health services. Some said their access was based on who they were, for example, if they were an essential worker, who they knew or what resources they had access to. For example, if they had a car or could afford to pay for taxis or private health care. And some said their access depended on help from family members or other contacts. An older woman in the Dominican Republic said, well, thankfully, there's a girl who's helping me. She's a cardiologist, the wife of a cousin of mine. She took me to the place where she works, did the echo test or the heart studies and analysis. She sent me to the place where a friend of hers works for a stress test. If it weren't for that girl, Next slide, please. Some older people we spoke to said they had friends or families who could support them access services online. Others said that respect for a person's rights and how they were treated depended on where they lived. Like the older woman in Canada who said, older people are treated well here in St. John's, Newfoundland. You wouldn't find the same problems here as you would in Ontario and Quebec. Next slide. Others said that only certain privileged older people were consulted or had access to decision makers. An older man in Kenya said, it would be good to have an older people's representative to talk to decision makers about how older people can get direct help. The government should reach out to older people at the grassroots and not just to the more privileged members of society. Our elected leaders should be accessible to everyone during a pandemic. Thank you, next slide. We also found that significant gaps in their understanding of rights. Some of the older people we spoke to thought their rights were the preferential treatment they got because they were older, such as priority seats on public transport or a designated queue in a medical center. Others thought that their rights were limited to meeting their basic needs. Some confused their rights with regulations imposed during the pandemic. Many said that the government was not aware of their rights and that most governments who, most of the older people who thought their government was aware said it did little to respect them. An older woman in Kyrgyzstan said, I'm not certain that authorities know what our rights are. 
They probably know we have to get our pension on time and that's why it's paid on time. But they don't know how our other rights are being violated because they're not in interested. If authorities understood our rights better, there would be fewer patients and people would not be dying. And finally, the older people in this consultation said they wanted better protection of their rights in practice and in law. They said existing laws should be implemented, services provided equally for all, and service provision improved. So how does this strengthen our case for a convention on the rights of older people? Responses to COVID-19 reflect the systemic ageism and the way our rights in older age were denied before the pandemic. However, the catastrophic impact of public health responses on the rights of older people reinforced the absolute urgency of better protecting our rights in older age now in both law and practice. I think a convention could make a practical difference in four ways. It would be a solid base for a fairer society by helping to ensure that all older people everywhere and not just those with connections and resources are treated in a fairer and more just way. It would result in better services for all by helping to ensure that governments, the private sector and others design and deliver services that respect older people's rights. It would be a clear guide by being the go-to place to get guidance on what older people's rights are and how to respect them. And finally, it would be a driver for change by setting in motion a chain of events that would improve our lives in older age. Next slide, please. As one older woman in Pakistan said, if older people are guaranteed their rights, it will surely change the attitudes and behavior of society and authorities towards them. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bridget. I, I think what I introduced you as uh, in terms of being clear and succinct I think if you could hear the applause, you would hear a standing ovation for both you and Rio right now. So thank you very much to both of you. Um, uh, we do have um, some time now, and I would, with your permission, Rio and Bridget, um, throw some questions at you uh, from the chat and also some that um, I've heard from different people who may not be on the call. So let's start with, um, with one that comes up time and again and I see that coming up here um, and I'll paraphrase it. One of the questions is, so, you know, why, why do the current treaties not cover older people? Um, why do we need special treaties? And, and I, I'm sort of planting the seed here for both of you. We do have special treaties for disabled people, for women and children. And why did we need those in the first place is, is sort of a, it's a lead to the to the answer. I'm hoping you'll provide. Um, maybe Rio, you can start, and Bridget, you feel free to jump in as well. Well, thank you, Kieran. Well, you know, I mean, lo looking way back when the um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted in 1948. And, and Craig talked about uh, in the in the last uh, webinar that there's no recognition of age in terms of discrimination. There's no recognition of older per persons, and, and that may really reflect that you know the time of the you know uh, history. Um, my own country, Japan, back then, you know, right after the war, we had um, we we had around. 100 people who are aged 100 and above, the centenarians. Now today, so that was 100 in 1948. And today we have more than 80,000. So the time has changed and, and the need to protect this you know, growing population is is emerging so it's it's really time for the un human rights system and the law to to play a catch up and that's that's why that you know there is specific convention addressing children women and disabilities and although they of course there are older women okay there's no older children but there are older women there are older 
people with a disability, but there's nothing that really so comprehensively address and provide. Uh, you know, one of the the question asked by the participant is: Is there a model legislation? Well, uh, there there is none. I mean, there are. Uh, for the each working group sessions, member states submit their laws and policies and experience, but the assessment is that they're not comprehensive, um, and there is, and that alone, you know, points out to the need to have international standard and 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 a convention to protect them. Thank you, uh, Bridget. Would you like to add anything to Rio's comments? I just very quickly, I mean, I think, yes, we do have the, the two international covenants on civil and political rights and economic, social, cultural rights, and they do cover a whole range of our rights, and they do cover all of us, um, but they don't go into the depth or the specifics of particular types of discrimination or particular types of violations of rights, um, whether it would be sexism or ageism or, or um, racism. And so having these specific treaties only adds to our understanding and the sort of our, the, the, so I don't think that they, the additional treaties should be seen as, as something to fear or, or some additional burden, rather the opposite. They're things that like they, add our, they add and build on how we understand how human rights um, apply in specific circumstances. And I think that, that there does seem to be a real sort of a fear of, a new, of new instruments, but rather I think we should embrace them as seeing as sort of adding to a wealth of understanding. Thank you. That's that's very helpful. Um, just as a follow up of that, um, and again, I'm, I'm going to probe uh, your um, your personal thoughts as well as your sort of overarching UN thoughts. Um, you know, people are afraid. They're you know, people when people are afraid, they become very defensive and guarded and suspicious of of our motivations and motives. People have asked, are there any special uh, uh, protocols to to protect people is, for example, older people in a pandemic. Um, are there any, I think Rio, you read this question, model national legislations, which you answered, we don't have, but um, are there any sort of cost benefit analysis to having a convention on the rights of older people? And my, my proposal to you is that this is not a resource driven issue. It's more a problem of not having good standards and ways to enforce the rights of old people. Am I right about that? I think Craig also said that in one of his talk. So I just wanted to put that question out there. Um, and Bridget, maybe you can start with that one if you like. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not, a, I, I certainly don't think of it in terms of like sort of cost benefit analysis as such, but I think we just have to look to the, um, the experience of, from other treaties to see the, the impact that they can have. Um, and we, we know that um, the other human rights treaties have set in motion changes within the law, changes within practice, um, changes within attitudes amongst society. I think that um, sort of empowering of the rights holders to claim their rights because they, they know what their rights are, they're there, they're clear for everyone to see and they, they're empowered to claim them. So I think that if, if we're looking for um, evidence about how treaties make a difference, I, I think we can see it in the experience of, of the ones that already exist. Yeah. Rio? Thank you. Uh, first, in terms of protocol in the context of pandemic, I mean, there have been uh, many, many guidances issued by uh, national authorities and, and, and WHO. Um, in terms of cost benefit, I, I think the working group need to go through this discussion at one stage. Um, but I you know, there was a similar um, concerns or, or fears uh, before the Convention on the Rights of the Persons with Disability was adopted. You know, people's governments will say, oh, it's gonna cost so much in terms of, you know, adapting those buildings and, and, and putting handrails and 
paving, making the pavements, uh, etc. But but look at it. Look at the society now. I mean, all the countries now committed to improve their infrastructure, make investments, uh, and all the persons will be the same. So I mean, from here it's my personal thought. But you know, if a country will make that argument, it will be cost costly to have a conversion. Well, then let's also calculate the cost of not having uh, older persons contributing more to society after 60 or 65, what will be the uh, you know, opportunity cost uh, uh, to the society? Okay, thanks. Yeah, so what would be the cost of not having a convention and, and turn it on its head and see if we can um, use that as an argument? That's great, thank you. And, and there might be more questions about this because that's one of the fears of governments, right? Is what does this mean in terms of the, the impact on? But I don't think it's a resource issue. It's more a lack of standards and really ways to enforce those standards. Um, a very interesting question uh, from Irene Turpey. And she says, um, who would you define as an older person? Any quick thoughts on that? Um, Rio, maybe we can start with you. Well, as you know, there is no um, internationally accepted, agreed definition of older persons, certainly in terms of a chronological age. And uh, older persons need, I mean, especially in the current context, people living longer and contributing longer, um, older persons need to be understand more, much more flexibly um, in, in that uh, the framework. And certainly not based on, you know, 60 or 65 or 70. Bridget, do you, would you like to add to that or? Um, just perhaps if we think about um, a definition of an older person in the context of a new convention, um, I think the key thing to ensure is that the convention is fit for purpose and that it, uh, it will cover everyone whose rights may be denied on the basis of their age or who may be subjected to ageism on the basis of their older age. And we know that that can happen um, from perhaps from younger ages than we might expect. I mean, here in the UK, there's research that shows that women in the labor market can experience age discrimination um, from their mid forties, so uh, as early as that. So I think that to try and define an older person with one age within a convention is going to render the convention unfit for purpose because it will exclude people who could be subjected to ageism on the basis of their known or perceived older age. So I think, it, I think it's useful to think about definitions in that way rather than thinking we need to have one, but think about, well, what is the, pur the purpose of the convention and what would it try to do and how can we help it do that? Thank you very so much, uh, Bridget and Rio. Um, Vijay, who is, uh, by the way, uh, Vijay Naraidu, who some of you may know, but he's the co-chair of the of Garup, uh, Garup Steering uh, Group, has a question. And he's, um, he's wondering if the government should actually go to the grassroots to get input into this uh, process. Um, any thoughts on that? Perhaps. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. I, I, absolutely. Of course they should. I mean, they, you know, the the governments have an obligation to consult with with the people um, under their jurisdiction, and so I think the uh, a convention will be again thinking about making international law fit for purpose. It will be far more effective and a far better convention if it's grounded within people's um, lived reality and their experience. And the only way to find that out is to go and talk to people. So I think absolutely um, they should, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Real. And, and we should make sure that consultation is, is, is a real one and not just a token consultation um, um, encompassing all civil society directly with older persons. And there should be um, also some kind of a accountability and monitoring mechanism built into it to make sure that that happens. 
Thank you. Uh, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here because uh, they're both from people that we work with on a regular basis. One is Francis, there's a night in, and the other one is Ken Bluestone. Uh, so there, the question from Ken is, uh, your res what is your response to those who say that we do not have enough evidence yet that a convention is necessary? And Francis also says, what do you say to governments that believe that they can add it, they have adequate legislation policies and programs, anti-discrimination laws, et cetera, without a need for a convention. Ria, would you like to start with that? And give Francis a minute. So to for, first to Francis questions, and I I you know, every year I go through all the submissions from the member states and Last year, one submission really stuck out to me that they're saying that you know their their laws are, are pretty good and we don't need uh, international convention. And I will say that well, if that's so, there's no reason not to um, object to the international convention. And and moreover, there is a lot of benefit for that country to be in the lead. Um, and sharing the experience and, and those good practices. So um, I don't think that's a very uh, good uh, argument when you look at more international uh, perspective uh, beyond the national borders. Um, and in terms of more evidence, well, I think, you know, for those uh, unconvinced member states, maybe there's not um, there's never be uh, enough uh, evidences to, to, to be shown, but I think at some point in time, this is not going to be just a, you know, um, technical exercise of, you know, building up enough evidence or not. I think we need to create uh, a political momentum um, to, to, to tip the, the balance uh, towards the uh, convention. And I think that you know, as I said before, maybe, you know, this is a, a moment now with this COVID pandemic situation, we should try to brainstorm and capitalize as much as possible um, using everybody's uh, civil society network to mobilize the support and, 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 and to tip that uh, the balance uh, towards the convention. Thank you. Right. Bridget, any words of wisdom? Um, I, I think when people talk about evidence, I, I wonder if they're really talking about evidence or whether this is one of the, the sort of the many sort of arguments that are given just to stall the political process, I think. I mean, I, I think that that there is, we have 10 years of evidence from the open-ended working group. I think there is ample evidence out there. Mm -hmm. And on adequate legislation as well, I mean, I, I agree entirely with what Rio said, but to add to that, perhaps, you know, even those who think they have the perfect anti-discrimination legislation, for example, well, perhaps they don't. Perhaps there is room for improvement. You know, do they have um, a duty to assess the impact of all of their decisions and policies on older people? Do they have an age equality duty? Um, does their legislation fully um, address intersectional discrimination or cumulative discrimination that we've been talking about at the Open Ended Working Group? So I think, you know, there is always room to improve your legislation and, and, the, and the convention and can guide governments to do that, I think. Yeah. Bridget, I, I really like your answer. I think you're calling a spade a spade. And, you know, in, in my line of work, uh, we have three different mechanisms that people use to deal with difficult situations. One is denial. Oh, it doesn't exist. The other is, oh, it exists, but it's not a big problem. It's minimization. And the third is, oh, yeah, you, you have it and it's small and you rationalize it somehow that it's okay. So those are very common defense mechanisms. Uh, this is a really good question and I'll just, um, it's from an un, someone who doesn't have a name up there, but it's very simple. It says, we need a convention on the rights, on the, on the rights of older persons. So um, that it will make governments more responsible and caring for older people. Um, why is there so much delay?
I, I just have to ask you, Rio and Bridget. Well, I mean, obviously, I mean, there are different perspectives among member states, those who are uh, for conventions, those who are not um, in favor or, or, or reluctant to consider those conventions, and the reasons could be many. Uh, not only, and some of them probably not uh, just on the substance, but more political or ideological. So there are many uh, hurdles uh, still to uh, overcome. Bridget? Um, I, I think that to the person who asked that question and perhaps to everybody on this call, mm -hmm. I think that is a really good question. And it's one that you should be asking your governments in the run up to the next session at the end of March. I mean, that is a question for them. Why are they delaying this, I think? Yeah, it's, I, I completely agree with you. I think there's so much evidence now that we've got a mountain of evidence. And if someone chooses to not take that into consideration in the in the strategy and in, in the solution, then it's a governmental issue. So please take um, it back. Sorry, if I may just uh, come back again on this. Yes. Um, so I said in our study update, we try to be more evidence-based and looked at the records uh, recommendations from the system. So if the country X say that, you know, there is, you know, all these conventions and treaty bodies and that's enough, right? Then uh, perhaps we should be looking at the real records of that country. How many times have they used the existing mechanism to raise the issue of older persons over the last 10 years? And, and I think the, the scorecard will be very clear. Mm -hmm. So we should do audits. Okay, perfect. Um, there's two or three questions about specific um, uh, rights and I'll just lump them together just because we're gonna run out of time and we can come back to some of these. So there's a question about adding disaster and pandemic as special attention, rights to live, right to healthcare, freedom from discrimination in healthcare rehabilitation, not using the word social distancing when it comes to, um, to the, the public health aspect. Um, any thoughts on the, the, oh, and there's also a, a question about specifically having women's issues uh, given that they live longer and without a partner. Um, and, and I don't mean to put them all together, but because of time today, I wondered if you have any high level comments on those uh, inclusions um, at the open-ended working group. Um, Bridget, would you like to take a stab at that and then give Rio a minute? Um, uh, may maybe just to say that I think all of those rays are really, really important. And um, what we would want to see is a convention that is comprehensive and that is systematic and that it does look at the whole range of rights that we enjoy in our older age. And it does look at those, those intersections between, for example, if, if we are um, a woman or if we are a person with disabilities, so it's looking at those different intersectionalities as well. So, so I think it's, it's, it's good to have, have them named. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so just add to what Bridget has said, the working group has been um, focusing on specific female issues since 2017. So um, this year is on the right to work and access to justice. Um, the working up group has already looked at um, long-term care, but not yet on health, which is on the sort of rolling list for future uh, possible topics. And, and the humanitarian situation disaster could also uh, be one. Um, the regional convention in, in, in the Inter-American Convention has a specific uh, uh, clause article about uh, those humanitarian situations. So, as you know, um, Bridget said, we need to be as comprehensive as possible. So uh, it will be good um, that if everybody engage in these uh, thematic discussions um, this year and in, in futures. Thank you. So we do have a, a number of other questions and perhaps time permitting, we can come back to them um, after the next two speakers. Uh, 
So Rio and Bridget, you can take a minute and relax uh, for, for a few minutes while the two Margarets speak now. Um, please allow me um, to introduce you to Margaret Gillis. Um, and she, uh, so both Margarets, uh, Gillis and Margaret Young, the two, two, the two speakers, are both Canadians actually, who I work with on a regular basis. So Margaret um, uh, Gillis is uh, the founding president of the International Longevity Center of Canada, which is part of a global alliance of 16 centers dedicated to the needs and the rights of older people. An award-winning executive and innovative leader, leader uh, Margaret has played a key role in establishing the age-friendly community program, both in Canada and internationally. This program is now in over 900 Canadian communities and 26 countries worldwide. Other career highlights include a joint government project to protect seniors in disasters, including a policy paper presented at the UN. Margaret's work uh, is uh, acknowledged by Her Majesty the Queen through an award for her international contribution to older people. Uh, Margaret has very strong credentials and is a very strong speaker on the human rights of older people working with and speaking at the UN General Assembly on behalf of older people and as a Canadian delegate to the Organization of American States. She's also done a lot of work with children before she started to do more work with older people. So she's got both ends of the spectrum uh, covered. She's currently the chair of the National Advocacy Working Group at the Global Alliance of the Rights of Older People. And with this background in health promotion, protection and programming for the aged women and children, she is totally committed to improving the rights of older people. And I might add, she is a delight to work with. Margaret, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kieran. And um, thank you, Gareth and IFA for this opportunity and for your leadership in driving preparation for Open Ended Working Group 11. This meeting is more important than ever, given the experiences of the last year. Now, we have heard from our two excellent speakers that COVID has revealed the rampant ageism that is a global phenomena. And we have also learned about the inadequacy of current United Nations international human rights frameworks, which have left older people without the same rights and protections enjoyed by other groups. So what are we gonna do about that? I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what we've done in Canada, uh, a bit as an example. So in my country, Canada, the death of older people uh, from COVID-19 in long-term care is well known now internationally as a national disgrace. At one point, we had 80% of COVID deaths happening in long-term care. And this situation has rightly driven activists on aging issues to demand rights and real societal change. I want to uh, read you something that has been uh, uh, a real impact on um, the ab uh, advocacy in my country. And these are the words of one personal support worker in a long-term care facility in the city of Hamilton. It's from last month. Uh, and I quote, the images of residents, some hanging out of beds, moaning, vomiting, crying. It's all too much to bear. I cannot sleep at night. Others describe the long-term care home as a war zone. The chaos, the confusion, the outright neglect was criminal. Now we should all be infuriated by the injustice of the people left in such horrific circumstances, whether it's the people themselves or the workers there that uh, have to deal with this issue. But we need to take that anger at that injustice and we need to move it to action. Whatever motivates you, the stories, the horrible statistics, the, uh, even if it's effective measures that you've heard of that have saved lives, take those and use them to motivate yourselves and your organizations because the time to act is now. So let me share with you uh, what we've done in Canada and the tools that are available both from Garup and other organizations uh, like Bridget's Help Age International's It's About Rights campaign. And I wanna challenge you to fight for the rights which have been so sorely ignored due to ageism. Now, the first thing to do is really craft your message and position your message using data. And this was mentioned by our earlier speakers. One aspect of COVID-19 is that the raging ageism is easy to spot and to explain in many countries. So look what's happening in your country, take it and use it. Now work to influence your government. Where do they stand on the convention? 
um, if they support it, ask them to make that clear at the open-ended working group through submissions and in their statements. If they are on the fence like Canada or against the convention, use the rights arguments to um, influence their positions. It's critical to make the case at country capitals as we have done in Ottawa, as this is where decisions are made. We are in uh, continual contact with our politicians and bureaucrats to make the case. And in fact, Kieran and I are meeting with Global Affairs this afternoon on the issue. Um, you need to build partnerships. Um, you can start by um, working with ethical media in your uh, country. Um, use Twitter and social media for instant updates. In Canada, all political figures have Twitter accounts. Find them in your country and tag them on your posts. Um, as Rio Haddam noted, use your key messages to engage uh, people and in each tweet or interview, but keep it simple. The ill treatment of older persons is a human rights abuse and we need a United Nations Convention on the Rights of Older Persons to address it. Team up with like-minded organizations. Join with others, as we have with the International Federation on Aging and CanAge, amongst others. Host joint webinars, as we have done. Um, send out joint press releases, letters to government, put them into your requests into federal budgets, and retweet and redistribute each other's messages to keep the issue in the public eye. We also need to look for new allies. We've been looking in Canada to pension and labor organizations, elder abuse prevention organizations, disability groups, and human rights groups. We need to put a glaring spotlight on the treatment of older persons, harness that with renewed vigor, and focus and use real local examples to gain support. We can use open-ended working group 11 by having statements ready by non-governmental organizations and others, consider hosting side events um, besides speaking to your capital, contact your UN ambassadors at the UN in, in New York and make sure that they know that you expect them to be active at Open Ended Working Group. We have our ambassador, um, Ambassador Bob Ray, speaking at our Open Ended Working Group 11 side event on March the 30th. You also wanna maximize the chances in public to hold the shameful treatment of older persons to the mirror, reflect it right back on society from whence it came and call it for the injustice that it is. The civil rights movement in the early days of activism used a saying from an old folk song, keep your eyes on the prize. We can learn from them. Our prize is the human rights for older persons and our first step is to get a convention on the rights of older persons. Keep your eyes on that prize. Now, one positive aspect of the systemic human rights violations in Canada during the pandemic, a country, by the way, with uh, very strong human rights legislations, uh, in, uh, is that it has clearly demonstrated the need for a UN convention on the rights of older persons. We know that conventions with appeal mechanisms allow organizations to bring forward issues during country reviews at the UN and I, for one, look forward to the day I can stand in front of the UN Human Rights Council and call Canada to task if these outrageous inequities continue. Now get out there and change the world and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Margaret. Um, uh, if it's okay with, uh, with you, I'm going to move on to uh, have Margaret Young speak and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, I've also um, reached out to the panelists to see if they would be able to um, help answer any questions beyond the webinar. And I think I'm just waiting for some of you to respond. Uh, some are comfortable with that. Uh, so please keep that in mind uh, if we can't get to all the questions today. So Margaret Young, another Canadian fellow um, um, who, again, we've had a privilege of working with quite closely over the last few months. Uh, so she has an executive MBA and a diploma in gerontology, is a social entrepreneur and an applied gerontologist. Margaret has an insatiable curiosity that fuels her desire to engage, to understand and connect people for action. This curiosity was pivotal in her award-winning career with Canada's largest financial institution where she honed her craft in system thinking, organizational development, and leadership. This curiosity also shapes her path in becoming a champion for older people. Conversations with older persons and nonprofit board work exposed her 
to both the systemic challenges and human right potential in aging. And sorry, human potential in, in aging. This is why Margaret was, uh, has founded the Age Noble, which is a Canadian social enterprise through intersectoral collaboration. Age Noble empowers older persons and strengthens the ecosystems needed for secure and thriving lives. Along with Age Noble, Margaret amplifies impact by volunteering with like-minded organizations such as Garup, Pasadon Network, and older person serving nonprofits. Her dedication to the cause is not only invaluable, it is inspiring. Margaret, you've got the floor. Thank you, Kieran. Um, today, I'd like to bring forward uh, a, a campaign. That's an idea that came from our Garrett members. And it's the uh, slogan campaign. I think with some of the conversation we have earlier, uh, we want uh, and we would benefit from activism uh, locally, nationally, and we thought about, uh, you know, what is the way to approach that? And the Garrett members really thought that it's really now the time, the right time, and the needed time to turbo our campaign uh, for three key reasons. There are many, but three key reasons. Uh, the first is that uh, 146 member state actually signed the UN policy brief on the impact of COVID on older person. And within that policy brief, there's actually a recommendation uh, to accelerate the efforts to develop proposals for an international legal instrument to protect and to promote the rights of, and dignity of all the people. So really that, that's the emphasis that, you know, the timing is really right for with our member states. Um, we also felt that while we are doing really great work uh, regionally, locally, nationally, that having a slogan would really unify, unify all of our voices much stronger and louder together. And the third reason, despite the work that we're all doing, as we would probably see amongst us, and, and I think with the question that BJ Rose uh, you know, posed earlier, there's much opportunity to really onboard more people, individuals and in society to understand the need of why we want to uh, promote and protect the rights of older person and why we need a convention. So with the campaign, what we did was we actually, all the members submitted, you know, their, based on what they see, their experiences, what a, what a, a great uh, slogan would be for, for the campaign. We went through the process of shortlisting it and then, um, and then we went through a voting process. And interestingly, through the voting process, we actually have a tie between uh, two final, uh, final slogan names, which is really cool. So, so what we did was we, we looked at the two slogan names and went back to sort of why the reason for the slogan and what are the key messages that we want to, to, to send. So if we go to the next slide, what we'll see uh, is actually some reflections and, and why, uh, why we, you know, in terms of the slogan. So really uh, number one is that human rights are, are, are entrenched for all human beings throughout our lives, regardless of where we're in the world that as we age, there are more complex needs and aging issues that's not covered in existing instruments, especially in light of the 100 year life, as we all point out earlier. And that, you know, existing uh, instruments is just not enough uh, in terms of coverage and support. So we, we want a convention to ensure that we prohibit ageism in law. We want a convention to ensure that, you know, as we age older, that we treat it with dignity and respect. And we want it a convention because we need the rights of older persons to be protected and codified. And it's not only for the older person today, but really it's for benefits to all um, for today and tomorrow. So we go to the next slide. What we'll see is um, the, the campaign slogan is actually age with rights. Um, and age here is in the context of, of a verb that we're, as we're aging, we, the rights don't leave us. It doesn't expire. It continues with us. We actually, um, upon you know, looking at this name, we also had an opportunity to look at how well does it translate into different global languages? Because this is for all of us around the world. And, it, and as you can see from some of the examples on the screen, it seemed to resonate quite nicely. Uh, in terms of the, the color for the campaign, we thought we needed something that's really bright and vibrant. 
um, and, and it's a color that you see in the background for my, uh, my screen, is actually a bright red orange. And the reason why we went with something really bright uh, and vibrant to, for two reasons, two key reasons. One is that it's this message that older persons are not gonna be silent anymore. That we have voices, we're vibrant, we're gonna speak up. The second is that as we age, you know, we have bright moments in our lives. And despite the fact that we might feel achy or, you know, our eyesight might not be as good anymore, we still have bright hopes, bright dreams and bright moments in our lives. in just like any other age in our life. So that's why we thought a very bright color to kind of, uh, to, to support the campaign. So as we um, go to the next slide, what we'll see is that we, the, the team thought about like, how, how do we kind of use some of these uh, slogan assets? So uh, one very straightforward one is, you know, use it as a hashtag, as Margaret Gillis said, when you're tweeting, age of rights, right? Very quick, snappy uh, to catch on. Um, you know, that's a social media piece, but also in our written communication and statements, let's start using that so that the, the you know, it becomes one of the items that is very consistent in our messaging. Um, the other thing that you will see on the screen, uh, the circle is actually a photo frame. So, you know, and, and, and then you, it might be kind of small on the screen, but you can see that there's actually an age of rights uh, around the banner. So you, would, might, you probably will see something like this either existing uh, uh, in LinkedIn or in, uh, in uh, Twitter or in, uh, in uh, uh, different types of social media. So if we kind of look at this, um, yeah, so it works also quite nicely in different languages, uh, even on Zoom, uh, in terms of the profile that we have. If we go to the next screen, uh, next slide, thank you. So here, the next, uh, next couple of slides are actually tools and templates that the team has provided, and it's available on the uh, Garrett website. If you go to the home page, uh, go under resources, you click that, the first drop down is the Age of Rights campaign. And within there, you'll, you'll find the photo frame campaign uh, uh, tool like this one, or we go to the next page, uh, next slide, sorry. Um, even uh, some tools and tips on how to use Twibbon in terms of creating these photo frames. Uh, next slide. Uh, the template for the virtual background is also there as one of the tool set. And next slide. And we'll continue to actually uh, add more templates and tools um, uh, once we start using them and we get some feedback from you in terms of what else might be uh, really helpful uh, to the campaign. We also have a list of different suggestions of what to do in different scenarios, uh, examples, in terms of leveraging the assets, right? Wear orange, you know, where we can. Uh, any parts, be it like a, a tie, a scarf, a ribbon, whatever it might be, that really kind of scream that, you know, uh, uh, age of rights campaign. So um, the next slide, please. So there are a lot of things that we kind of mention as opportunities. So uh, going up to uh, OEG, OEGW 11, um, and in the next while, something that's really easy to implement is, uh, you know, in your social media, the hashtags, using the photo frames and then the virtual background because so much of our work is gonna be virtual. Uh, that'll be really great. And um, incorporating the age of rights into your, your messages. Uh, next slide. So, so that's really, uh, we're really, really excited that we're launching the, the, the global campaign today because in inspiring words of uh, Gandhi, the future really depends on what we do today. Um, and, and it's not, and the we is means uh, even more of us. And, and one of the ways to do that is to get this uh, slogan, start using it and getting more people on board. Because, uh, you know, the term age of rights will probably tweak curiosity as we share with folks and that we can then start having those conversations to bring more people on. Um, we love to have hear what you th uh, think as you start using the tools and working with the campaign. Uh, please email us at info at uh, rights of older people Thank you. So that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a ton of work and a lot of information, um, Margaret, for sharing with uh, with uh, with her participants today. So thank you for all your hard work. Um, I am getting messages that we may actually not have a lot of time left, um, and I'm wondering if um, 
if the if the panelists would be comfortable if we could answer some of these or address them after the webinar and I'm hoping that we can there are um, I think we have a couple of minutes and I'd like to just throw this open there's a, a number of people who've written about this so I just wondered if uh, if someone could take this question from any of the four panelists uh, and the, a lot of this has to, has to do with the lack of um, um, rights of people who are in uh, who are at risk of dementia there's the palliative care angle people living in home care like in um, in homes in especially there's a couple of questions from people from India where they weren't able to address the rights of older people in their homes and institutions the governments didn't respond to them I wondered if anybody could could give the, um, the participants any tips on how they can manage that I can, I can take a stab at, at part of the issue in, with India in terms of uh, when your politicians ignore you. Uh, and that happens a lot everywhere. Um, so I think that's one of the important parts about finding allies, um, maybe looking at writing campaigns and also getting media coverage um, so that you sort of push them into the point where they have to start answering. Uh, it's, it's a lot of work uh, and you need allies, but it is one way uh, to make change. Uh, the Canadian government told me about five years ago uh, when we were speaking to them uh, about the convention that they wanted to see a grassroots response. And so we've been working on that. And I think uh, that may be the kind of thing that catches the attention of politicians. So uh, there's a quick answer to a very complex question. Yeah, translate them to votes. Yeah, that's good. There's also the issue of LGBTQ um, to attract attention at the grassroots level. Um, there was a question by Erica Dar, Dar on the, the Friends of Older People, the group of friends rather. Um, has there been anything that's happened as a result of that agenda? P please provide a status. Um, anyone want to take that? Well, um, I'm not really in a position to answer that question because it's the group of friends are, uh, you know, group of member states. And um, but what I like to highlight is that you know after the uh, policy brief on by the Secretary General, there is a cross regional group of member states um, initiated uh, a, a joint letter of support, and and this this happened without the. Uh, um, the working group chair, um, because he has been hospitalized. So that group of friends really mobilized different member states to have a large a group of states um, um, signing up to this uh, support letter. And I hope this, um, you know, collaboration will uh, continue. Okay. There's some uh, very nice comments about the campaign. Uh, Margaret Young just uh, for your information, I think you will get some some very good traction uh, as a result of that. I'm afraid um, I apologize, but I think we are out of time now. But um, are, are you comfortable, the panelists, if we can maybe address some of these questions uh, after the webinar? Would that be reasonable? Just feel free to uh, to put it on the chat if you like. Um, and I'll I'll just do some closing remarks quickly. We know that. The voices of older people in civil society is really critical to convince your governments to support the the need for a convention on the rights of older people i think we now have mountains of evidence especially after the gaps uh report that uh, that rio has spoken about today and others have as well and uh, uh, highlighted by bridget's uh, brilliant uh, survey i wanted to also say that you know when we do surveys of older people and we do get responses. These are people who actually can speak and have a voice and can reach out to us. But we also have to remember there's a lot of older people who, are, who don't have the capability of reaching out for many reasons, digital divide, lack of cognitive abilities, sequestration and so on. And they don't really have a voice even at this platform. We do need to raise our voices now to ensure that we're heard at the 11th session. So please join our Age with Rights movement and work on your key messages, statements on the topics for the sessions, 
There are many resources on the Garup website. So I would encourage you, if you're not members, to consider joining Garup, to, uh, to look at the resources we have, and please let us know how we can help you in getting the message out and how we can help you in crafting the message. I want to finish off by giving a, a huge vote of thanks to all our speakers today and to all of you, the attendants. Um, uh, I know Ellen um, uh, has posted a, a number of different uh, resources on the website. So Ellen, thank you for all your help as well today and Andra at the IFA. We could not have done this without you. So once again, thank you and best of luck at the Open-Ended Working Group. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye now.